The COVID-19 pandemic has created a global health and economic crisis. The disruption to business is unprecedented. While many businesses have been able to continue to operate, the adjustments that have been necessary in order to quarantine, social distance, minimize health risks, pivot and or innovate business practices have been enormous. As we begin to think about post-quarantine life, the varied expenses, experiences of employees in relative isolation, ranging from inconvenience to being traumatized, must be the starting point to plan work reentry. Getting back to business safely, Dr. Barbara J. Brown, a licensed clinical psychologist in Washington, D.C., will give us practical advice for employers and employees. Thank you for joining Sister Parra and welcome back, Dr. Barbara Brown. Thank you very much for having me back. Well, you know, you, we talked in the last segment on conscious self-care about the re-entry of work and now we're getting closer to that time. I know that Honolulu and I think DC, uh, we're, we're scheduled to go back. The nation is gonna go back June 8th. Well, that's the latest date that yeah, they're giving it. That's the latest date. Well, Dr. Brown, as we pivot towards reopening our doors and turning on the lights, many businesses are asking what and how to prepare. What are some guidelines you can share with us? Well, I think, you know, there are a lot of practical matters that need to be considered, especially around safety. And uh, a lot of people are taking care of that. I think we as psychologists and mental health professionals have been focused on uh, the psychology of it in terms of getting people back to work. People are still fearful. There's been uh, a lot of isolation, a lot of distancing from people and from the workplace, even though a lot of people are working, some have been furloughed. But, um, you know, it's been a new reality that people have gotten used to. And to go back to work um, is not always going back to the old practices. We have to do things differently in order to feel safe and comfortable. And there is the new normal. Yeah, right. The new normal, whatever that may be. I know, I just guess it's going back to work. Uh, with our masks going and ensuring that we wipe down everything. But the push to make money comes at a cost to our health. What's your message to people? I think that one of the reasons that we looked at the process of psychological reentry is because of what is happening in society. This, you know, choice between you know, people and humanity and, you know, making a living, you know, living and livelihood is um, unfortunately has been quite divisive at times. And I think trying to keep both in mind and in perspective is very important. Um, it's almost like we're living in this dystopian society where um, the haves and the have nots are getting more and more divided and um, we have to get back to our humanity in, you know, while we're trying to go back to work. Well, let's talk about the three steps to re-enter workforce. Uh, that is something that I know managers and supervisors and employers and employees are want to concentrate on. So walk us through the three steps. Sure. So yes, we, we advocate best practice as a three-step process where you're connecting with individuals and really showing um, compassionate leadership and really connecting with your employees to find out what, did they, what have they been going through? Um, what are their thoughts about coming back to work? How engaged or disengaged are they? Um, and then going through the process of wanting them to join uh, in a more cohesive way by forming work groups, uh, task force work groups, 
where they can have an, a say and input into how they come back to work. And then finally, um, being part of a larger community and getting the same messages through town hall meetings. So um, that's the three-step process, but I can go into each one a little bit more if you'd like. Well, especially the three steps to enter the workplace, the individual employee meetings you were referring to. Now, how should that take place? Is that, well, just give us a chart on that. Sure. It's best done um, as much as possible before people, you know, during this quarantine period, while people are still in quarantine, reaching out, managers and supervisors, reaching out to individuals, setting up meetings to check in with them. Um, again, see how they're doing, um, see how they're doing self-care. Uh, if they're working, then, um, you know, how productive, how, are they having any difficulties, how you can help them during this period of time, um, what they anticipate they will need going back. Um, again, people are in different circumstances. Some people have been in isolation totally by themselves. Other people have their children around them and sometimes their elders as well. And they're really quite busy being, you know, mom, teacher, you know, uh, worker, and it's very taxing on them. Um, and for other people who aren't as fortunate and are not working, they've been furloughed. Um, and a lot of them have been hopefully temporarily furloughed, and, uh, but they may be having hardship financially. Yeah, this is, um, this is just, it's challenging because you have to decide I need to work. We all need to work. We all need some form of income coming in. And then we need our health as well. I mean, you can't work if you're not healthy. So how are we going to talk to the managers and supervisors? How are they going to wrap their head around coming back? How does the managers and the supervisors and company um, owners make the employee feel safe? I think that Again, the notion of compassionate leadership means really being in touch with what your employees need. And I love there's a philosophy um, by a, a person named Bird Baggett that I have adopted. It's called the three levels of leadership. And level one is that when people understand you, uh, you get their attention. When people trust you, you earn their loyalty. And when people know that you really care, you get their hearts. And I think if managers uh, and supervisors really realize that the more they connect, the more they show um, compassion and real caring for their employees, they are going to get um, it back tenfold. And in terms of loyalty, productivity, willingness to cooperate, uh, engagement. And so it's a win-win situation that we're trying to create. That's wonderful. I know we started um, having our town hall meetings here in Honolulu. Let's talk about town hall meetings. Sure. I think that it's important that they be um, planful and really take into account uh, what people have heard, what the leaders have heard in their individual meetings. There are some common concerns around safety, fear, um, of getting coronavirus um, and desires to have the flexibility that they may have experienced at home and wanting to bring that back to the, the workplace. And um, so taking into account what they've heard and then hopefully the task force groups and I've, we've made some recommendations around task force groups around safety issues, around self-care and group connectedness, around policies and procedures and around innovations in the business. Um, and for my business also, we're doing, uh, well, that would be business innovation around telehealth because a lot of us are doing telehealth, uh, teletherapy at this point. So anything new that you've done, um, you know, we are trying to um, have work groups to make recommendations. So you wanna take those into consideration and then 
the leaders having gathered all that information from the individual meetings and from the work groups, then they can kind of cite uh, some major objectives that they want to accomplish. The first one, the first town hall is gonna be about how do we re-enter safely? And <clears throat> that will be, again, policies and procedures, you know, the equipment that's going to be needed. And I've seen some um, good materials also on having employees sign agreements um, that everyone is going to adhere to the same behavior to keep each other safe. And I, I like that. that it would be helpful. Okay, I like that. So continue to help us chart a path forward regarding workforce development and training issues. Um, so I think if, if you wanna take the safety piece first, yes. um, then it's really around um, what are the procedures just coming into the building? I, again, I can give our uh, example most easily. We have you know, administrative staff, we have clinicians, uh, and we're in a, a medical building. And so we have to work very closely with the, um, the people who own the building and making sure everything is clean and disinfected on a regular basis. We'll have to have our own cleaning supplies so that as um, people come in the door and as they use the offices that we're cleaning in between each time that, um, you know, that we've even gotten something from them on elevator use versus the stair use. So, uh, and then we have to have our PPE equipment, make sure we have our masks or we have our um, glass, <clears throat> um, the, the facial things that you can see each other. We, we would prefer that. Um, rather than having masks on as much as possible. Um, we've also been looking at practices that other doctor's offices are doing so that they're only either screening clients before they come in. Obviously, if they're not well, that uh, we will schedule telehealth as opposed to having them come in, um, but they only come in one at a time. There's no more uh, waiting room. Um, people don't come in the waiting room, they come in straight to the uh, sessions and uh, no more group conferences. We, we, are, we could only use spaces where you have at least six feet distance. So, um, and then we're going to be uh, flexible and having people come in, uh, not all at once. We have 50 clinicians. So we have to be mindful of how many people can be in the space at any given time. So all of those things, you have to adopt it to your own business. So this is, people do need time. Organizations do need time because you need to be very organized and have a mindset of safety first before the mm -hmm. dollar bill. So this sounds comforting. You have what, uh, four clinics and you have over 50 um, employees. So these are mm -hmm. excellent, excellent advices. Um, Dr. Barbara Brown, and we are talking about business reentry post COVID-19 quarantine. And to me, my personal view is I'm thinking about going back into the world. I want to do a virtual mental tour, of the places that I'm going to reenter to. And we were talking about the salons. We were talking about uh, our nails and hair and eyebrows and you know, shopping. And I think that people now need to just have common sense. It is common sense, but I do think the idea of a walkthrough, you know, and kind of to make sure that you've gotten all the details because it, it can get, uh, it's common sense, but you want to make sure that in your space that it will work. All right. Well, Dr. Brown, we are going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue our conversation about business reentry. Keep it there. Aloha, I'm Keisha King, host of Crossroads in Learning on Think Tech Hawaii. On Crossroads in Learning, our guest and I discuss all aspects of education here in Hawaii and throughout the country. You can join us for stimulating conversations to enrich, enliven, and educate. 
We are streamed live on ThinkTech bi-weekly at 4 p.m. on Mondays. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Welcome back to Sister Power, and we are chatting with Dr. Barbara Brown about the um, U.S. business reentry post-COVID-19 quarantine, and she is giving us some wonderful advice. So if you have a chance to grab your pencil and paper, this is the time to do it now. So Dr. Brown, let's talk about, let's tackle stress and empowering others to do the same. Because we were chatting earlier, that first day back at work is mm -hmm. going to be, that is a time that people need to feel really good. So can you give us tips on professional ways to quickly ease stressful situations involving employees? Well, I think the first way is trying to uh, minimize the level of uncertainty that people have. And by, again, having the task force groups where you've laid out things in particular, people know how they're going to enter. And as predictable as it can be, it will really alleviate a lot of anxiety uh, and fears. And then when people come in, um, having check-ins with them to make sure things are running smoothly. And if there are any problems that occur, trying to do problem solving as quickly as possible. Um, because as perfectly as we may plan it, things don't go perfectly, and you find out uh, more as you as you enter. So we need to be conscious that uh, we need to do problem solving along the way. Wow. And as long as they feel that, as, as if employees feel that you're being responsive, you're being observant, um, and you're reaching out when you need to, it will it will go pretty well. Oh, well, that's comforting. How to manage your team with empathy while driving results during times of high stress? I think that having good discussions with them about their roles and responsibilities at work and having them have some input in how they think they can best do it. Again, you're going to need more flexibility in coming in because you can't bring everybody in probably all at the same time. And so that's going to be done in kind of phased in work because you can't have as many people and you can't do business as usual. So you may be, instead of having, you know, uh, you know group meetings together, you can't do that. And so you may have to have continue to have them by Zoom or something like that. And so the flexibility that you need and having people have a say in how they can best produce what they need to and having those agreements will, will help and everyone be on the same page. Great, yeah. Let's talk about coping mechanisms that help you refocus and drive forward with an actionable plan. So, um, I think the best way to answer that is to um, have people have some uh, measurable goals that they can uh, come in with. And so the expectations um, being clear and, um, you know, to, you know, when, you know, people are feeling stressed, being able to talk about what they need in order to feel better. and. Again, if they're not feeling comfortable in the workplace, having the flexibility to still work, you know, off-site as much as needed. And so I think, you know, being able to state what they need, 
to their employers and being heard and being um, acknowledged will be very helpful. Okay, let, I'm gonna, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So how do you obtain actionable ways to gain perspective and lead with logic? Well, I think that hopefully the, there is a culture that your company has and um, some driving forces in it. And so again, for our company, we want to not only uh, deliver high quality mental health services to our clients and meet their needs, but we also wanna make sure that um, the clinicians are also, um, you know, doing self-care and um, doing things in a way that um, they won't uh, burn out <laughs> themselves. That's true. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Because with the country uh, back to work, how do we process that moving forward? How do we process getting back to back work? Back to work, or? yeah, before we get there. We're sitting at home right now. I mean, it sounds wonderful, but there's a, a process that we need to go through. I agree with that. I think that, again, uh, it's like, you know, having a countdown process, five, four, three, two, one, and uh, having some agreements on when to go back to work and probably going back in measured ways you know, instead of trying to, to force going back full time, you know, the first week, you know, going back in, in phases. Some Americans may work at home forever after COVID-19. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages? Well, people have a lot of flexibility at home um, and without the commute time, it's less costly often. Um, they can, um, you know, again, make their schedules work more for them. And so that is an advantage. I think we're trying to think about um, any liability issues as well of, you know, being home working and not having as much engagement with the company. So we're, we're working on ways to have regular meetings um, by Zoom maybe having some mandatory times where people do get together. Um, you know, we're trying to think that through so that we can have the best of both worlds. Mm. That sounds like that, that is um, comforting as well because you're thinking ahead about the liabilities for your employees. Mm -hmm. right. if, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I'm loving your no, advice. Thinking, we, we also are thinking about the cost of working at home. You know, we, we pivoted very quickly, but um, people are using their own equipment, their own laptops. We're not providing those things. And we have to think through whether we need to do more for them if they are going to continue to work at home. Uh, right. We're providing Zoom and the telehealth, but there may be more we need to do. Name a few key strategies to help supervisors support employee well-being during COVID-19. Again, having regular reach outs, uh, regular meetings, both team meetings, as well as individual meetings. Um, you know, um, you can also have fun things like I've been hearing people having happy hours with uh, cocktails or mocktails, um, having secret Santa where people are drawing names and, and uh, or picking random names and, and sending gifts. Um, I've heard also people having uh, exercise competitions where how many steps can they do. So fun ways of connecting as well as business ways and meetings. Mm, yeah, that sounds like fun. Dr. Brown, provide the viewers with the ideal snapshots or of re-entry into the workplace. Okay, so... Um, an ideal scenario is someone has been in touch with their manager. The manager really understands what they've been going through um, during this period of time, you know, of any stresses that they've had and giving them resources if they need them or um, understanding about the flexibility that they need coming in. 
that they have a, a sense of safety and they know what's going to happen um, in terms of maintaining that safety when they come in the workplace. And um, they have their set of roles and responsibilities and their priorities uh, made uh, that they've done collaborative, collaboratively with their managers and um, they implement it. Yeah, let's go back and let's talk about the task force groups. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the action steps for task force groups? Well, basically, um, working with the managers, they decide on a set of procedures that um, are going to be best practices for whatever they're doing. So say, again, we've talked a little bit about the safety group. So they have to think through all of the things that need to be done and all of the different uh, subgroups within the agency. So again, uh, whether it's administrative staff, labor force, managers, um, uh, professionals, they have to, each group needs to be part of those subgroups to say what is needed um, for their particular tasks to be done safely and how are they going to work together. Um, for the telehealth piece um, that we have or the business innovations, Again, uh, thinking through how many people are going to do that. Um, you know, what is that going to cost uh, for the company? What liabilities are there in these new innovations? What are the new policies and procedures that need to go with the new practices? It is important for managers and supervisors to let employees know that their safety, well-being, and role in the company matters. Give us more advice about that, because that's going to be very crucial for the employees coming back into the office. You know, um, a lot of it is letting them talk about what are they afraid of? You know, mm -hmm. what is driving them? And a lot of what I'm hearing from both clients as well as from my own staff is that um, some people have underlying medical conditions that have to be taken um, seriously. And they may not feel com comfortable coming back until there's a vaccine. Other people have elders or, or uh, children in the home and they don't want to infect them and put them at risk. Um, for others, it's just really simply that you know, again, it's the normal fear to have to, to get sick and potentially die. And so you just need to make sure that um, you're thinking it through in terms of their commute, to their time in the office, to, you know, just being in public. And they have not been. Some people have been less so than others. This is true. Is there anything that we haven't covered in the last two minutes that you can share with our sister power and think tech viewers? I just think that leaders need to, again, have a compassionate heart, have really good listening skills and really under, and understand their employees, be helpful where they can, um, provide resources where they need, uh, need to be given to them and be clear in communication and, um, maintain humanity um, over all else. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for this soothing advice that is so needed moving forward with the re-entry into the workplace. And we want to thank our Sister Power viewers. Please take care of yourself and each other. Aloha.